listeners, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah? Good. So, we have the Baldwin County Libertarian Convention, Convention. tomorrow. Yes. Saturday, October, whatever, 7th? Yes. 7th. At noon, Beef O'Brady's in Spanish Ford, Alabama. Should be a good time. I hear there's going to be an awesome speaker. Well, let's hope. (laughs) Let's hope. I've got... I mean, I'm excited. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. um, Maybe, you know, temper that a little. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) So, uh, just to let the the audience know here, um, they asked me to speak. Yeah. And I said, sure. And then uh, Liberty Larry said, have you seen the agenda? The other night. Yeah. (laughs) And I said, no, of course not, because it's on Facebook, and I don't get on Facebook. Yeah. And he said, well, let me read it to you. (laughs) And it was, you know, call to order and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. And then it said, keynote speaker. And that's me. (laughs) That'd be you. (laughs) And I said, keynote? Yeah. (laughs) And then there's not really much after that either. (laughs) I (laughs) guess. Oh, I get to close it? Great. <laughs> I mean, there's is, there's a little bit, but it's not a lot. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess I need to take this more seriously. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I've tried to take it more seriously in the last couple of days and yeah. put together a real plan. I have found, so, I, you know, I've done speeches of many different ways um, over time. And... So I've done speeches where I had the whole speech written out. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've done speeches where I had it essentially written out but memorized. Yeah. Um, and I, I've done speeches with note cards, and I've done speeches with bullet points, and I've done speeches with outlines, and I've done speeches where it was just like have a fair idea of what you want to say and use a lot of big words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is a- actually generally is the most effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was mostly academic stuff where like I was given a presentation on you know, a paper or a research or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I, yeah, I, I'm decided to go back to like, just have some notes and, and this is the way I have this one so far, the notes, I may have to like actually organize them into some kind of outline. <laughs> yeah. Um, because right now they're just like written all over in random yeah. places. On you the showed page. me, it was like, yeah, you're going to have to like really search around to find them all. <laughs> or I'm going to have to draw <laughs> lines before I get up there. Like I want to do this and then go to this part over on the bottom left. And then I want to go over to this part in the center, right. And then, a little bit to the left and then down to the right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I would advise it you like to, a just, really bad flow chart. to just write them down <laughs> in the order you want to do them. <laughs> that well, seems like the easier way to go. I don't, I don't know go. necessarily what order I want to do them, like hit the points in. Like, I don't know no. how it would be most effective. I think I have a rousing close, though. Well, that's good. Always, so, always good to end strong. Yeah. So. And then um, I'll have to come up with like a, a really... Uh, offensive lawyer joke to start things off considering the audience. Yeah, yeah there you go. That, that'll, all, that'll get them involved. <laughs> you have people walking out from the yeah. beginning. Like the, the, the way you measure a really good speech is if you can alienate your audience completely at the beginning and then they still like it and at then the they, end. And then win them back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the key. Everybody likes a challenge, right? <laughs> and then I have an excuse if it doesn't go well. Yeah, there you go. So... So, but what's the worst that could happen? I give yeah. a bad speech. Yeah, it'd be all right. Yeah, there, there's definitely worse things. I've seen you speak publicly. You'll be fine. Yeah, but I always feel so nervous. I had to yeah. get there early and get a drink at me first, or a couple of drinks, or a couple of drinks. <laughs> that used to work with music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when I when I was playing music out, like ha- definitely get there early, get a couple of drinks before I get on stage with the guitar. Yeah, yeah. and. Then it was just like it just seemed. It, then you'd be nice easier. and loose. Yeah, yeah like anxiety is not there to the same degree, or I can control it better, or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it did help with the creativity too. I've been yeah. uh, <laughs> I've been listening to this book called Drunk. We're yeah. never going to get into the actual topic tonight. Because <laughs> um, we, by the way, we have you a all lot. missed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we talked for like twenty minutes or so before we hit record. 
tonight too. So yeah, it's been a lot of. So, yeah, I've been already done a lot of sitting. I yeah. ain't used to sitting. <laughs> well, it's good for you. Uh, yeah, That's yeah. what every doctor says. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, yeah, I've been listening to this book called Drunk. Yeah. Um. By uh, a guy like he's um. Oh, it's like behavioral psych and stuff like that. It's uh, it's actually like really interesting where he's trying to go through the research and determine why it is that um, that humans uh, like mm. to get high. Oh yeah, and, and why it's practically a cultural universal. Yeah, like almost every culture had that, a way. Yeah, had some regular intoxicant. Yeah. yeah. Um, that they used. It is strange when you think about it because like generally speaking, at least animals in nature don't do that. No, they only do it by accident. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Um, but, but we seek it out (laughs) and it's called drunk because alcohol is by far the most ubiquitous one. Um, but he, he's talking about how there are alternatives to get the same kind of effects, like the, the things that are clearly positive effects without all the negative effects. So why is it that we continue to do this? Because there are alternatives that that don't present the same problems, but do present the same advantages. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. It's just been, it's just been really interesting, but the creativity part is one of the things that he, that he's been talking about, um, a fair bit in the, in the last couple of sections that I've, that I've listened to. Yeah. And it's about, um, essentially shutting off your prefrontal cortex that kind of opens up your mind. Well, the prefrontal con- cortex actually constrains it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's like shutting it down so that your, your mind can run w- a little bit more wild again, like outside the boundaries. Yeah. Um, that are normally. And there. yeah, so that that's essentially the, the process of um, brain development in humans is the, the maturation of the prefrontal cortex that kind of um, takes that, like uh kind of flighty all over the place brain that you have when you're really young yeah and and starts to hone um, it in con- yeah hone it in to be because c- it's it's advantageous to be that creative when you're young like it, yeah we, we're it's advantageous for us in development to be to explore and to think outside the box and to be creative and so forth yeah. but as you get older and you have responsibilities and like even in a state of nature we're talking about like you got to make sure that you're clothed and fed and the people around you are taken care of and you know well, all yeah. these things that and your body's not as resilient <laughs> yeah but like so doing stupid stuff can hurt well, you a lot true. more the older you get <laughs> that, that's certainly true too um but it's it's mostly about like keeping you focused yeah and uh like one of the examples he gives is, you know, talking about waiting at the door for his four year old to tie her shoes. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, you know, she's got one shoe on and you know, it's, there's so many problems here. Like it's not just that the four year old does has a complete lack of dexterity to actually perform it, yeah. but she also has a complete lack of ability to remember what all the steps are. Yeah. And beyond all that, she's really flighty. So you know, she's got her shoe on and she's working on the other one and I'm trying to wait patiently at the door, but then I go check the clock because we got some place that we want to be. And when I come back, now both shoes are off and ta-da, her <laughs> pants are off too. Yeah, we started <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that kind of behavior isn't real advantageous when you're a grown-up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, you got to you gotta stay a little bit more focused. And so the prefrontal cortex kind of reigns all of that in and yeah. keeps you focused so that you can, you know, in a modern time, like hold down a job and pay your bills and yeah. things like that, that a four year old couldn't possibly do. Yeah. And then every now and then you have a few beers to loosen that on up a little bit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when the time is appropriate. Yeah. If you're smart. Or you have a few more and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and then bad things can happen. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, it, anyway, it's been a fascinating book. Like I, um, the, the research has yeah, we're never going to get to the topic. Uh, <laughs> the The research has been really interesting. Like he was he was doing a lot of uh, talking about um, experiments they did with corvids, which are the the class of birds that includes ravens, crows, and jays. Okay. And I found these really interesting um, because they you know they're doing those uh, experiments that you've seen with pigeons, probably Maybe. where they they have a couple of panels 
um, with different colors on the panels, and then they show the pigeon uh, a, a particular color. And if the pigeon selects the right color from the panel, it gets a food reward. Yeah. All right. And pigeons learn pretty quickly. Like, how to get the reward. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so do all the corvids. They they learn really quickly how to get the reward. Yeah. Um, but the difference is that the the pigeons have trouble with like the next couple of steps of the experiments that they're yeah. doing with corvids, which is then they change out all the colors, like a complete new set of colors. Yeah. And they get it first try. Like you show them a, a, a new color from this new set. They still understand if I match the color, I get, I get the, the reward. Yeah. Well, then they take all the colors out of it and they replace them with shapes. So you got like a circle, a square, and a triangle in there, and they show it a, a triangle and it pecks the and it pecks the triangle. Yeah. Like first try, gets the reward. So, like what it's showing is that it can it can general it, like it can recognize general rules and then apply them to novel Other situations. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but but my favorite one was that they they. I don't know if this is going to translate very well to rate. Well, I, I heard it anyway. I, I heard it audibly in the first place. I it made sense to me, so it'll make right. sense to you guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, they uh, they tied a food reward on a long string from a perch. They were ravens in this experiment. Yeah. And um, but they set it up in such a way so that the birds couldn't get around the perch to get down to the food. Yeah. So the only way that the that they could get the food was to grab the string with their beak, pull it up, and then step on the string on the perch. Yeah. And do this like six or eight times until they could get the food close enough to reach it. Yeah. And all of the ravens figured it out in like two or three tries. And they said that the that one of them actually like sat on the perch and just looked around and assessed the situation for a minute or two and did it on the first try. Oh wow. <laughs> and I was like that's the that was that's your raven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> too smart for its own good. <laughs> I, and I was like, man, I know some people that couldn't figure that out. They would starve on that perch. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, oh. I'm like, but funny. I can't get to it. I can't reach it. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so I, I like, I've, I've been really enjoying this book yeah. and it's about one of my favorite pastimes drinking. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so after that lengthy introduction, yeah. I guess we can talk about some things. Yeah, what you want to talk about first? I don't know. You kept talking about the McCarthy thing. You wanted to talk about that, right? I, so, I mean, just kind of mention it. The, um, so for people who hadn't heard McCarthy was removed as speaker of the house, I guess. Was it Monday now? Tuesday? Early this week. Yeah, Tuesday, I think, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah, because I think like um Gates started the process Monday. Maybe they did it on Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday. Um but I don't know. I mean it's like it's a big deal. Um, you know, and and I mean it hadn't happened, I mean, in a long time. Like yeah. at least like this. Um and it what the thing I thought that was the most interesting about it was that um, oh, so over the weekend, they raised the debt ceiling, or they didn't actually raise it, I guess. They've kicked the can down the curb. Mm -hmm. um, but McCarthy did it with... Well, Demo they didn't do anything about the debt ceiling. They just extended the budget, right? Is that how it worked? Yeah, I think so. It's, they, still, they, it's still just a, a hard date deadline, though. They didn't actually... Yeah, they actually, took away the debt ceiling last year, or earlier last this time, year. Last time. Yeah. Last time we came to this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there's still no debt ceiling that really matters. I think that they just um, did essentially like a continuing resolution to maintain yeah. the funding. Yeah. Um, um, except that they took some things out. Yeah. Well, they took out um, all the Ukraine stuff. Yeah. That's I'm... not, I mean, they took out all the direct funding for it, but the Pentagon will continue its programs with Ukraine. Yeah, because I heard something just the other day that the Pentagon was complaining because, like, soon they're going to run out of money for this. Yeah. But they're still, like, they still have funding right now. Well, and before they, they actually came to this agreement, um, there there was talk about how that they were going to try and, uh, and, and stop the Ukraine funding with this. I thought that the only way that it was going to stop actually was if the government shut down. Yeah. But then the Pentagon said that it, the government shutdown wouldn't affect their Ukraine funding and that they had set, <laughs> you know, the Ukraine funding aside, all their Ukraine programs aside as essential to national security. So they would be exempt. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, that's, that's yeah, so. that's really central to our national security. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> um, so. So uh, it it won't 
It won't affect a lot of things anyway, I don't yeah. think, in terms of the Ukraine funding. Yeah. I'd like to think it would, but I don't think that it actually does. Yeah. So. Um, well, yeah. Uh, beyond it being kind of a, an unusual historic event, um, why do you think it's important? Uh, it's, it is just as far as like the politics of everything goes, as far mm -hmm. as with the Republicans. Like this, this hurts Republicans. Republicans, at least going into like the presidential. Yeah. Um, I mean, it makes them look disorganized. Like I'm all for it. Don't get me wrong. Well, I, I, I'll say on the other hand, it, you remember, um, you remember a few years ago when the progressives in, uh, in the house had the same kind of opportunity with, um, what's her name? Uh, Pelosi. Yeah. With Pelosi. Yeah. And they were saying, you know, that they would, uh, withhold voting, for her um, to be speaker until they got certain concessions about some programs that they wanted to enact. Yeah. Um, and then they all folded and just voted for her. Yeah. The Republicans didn't. That, well, this small, so that is, that is the interesting point to this too, is that there seems to be a small group of Republicans that mean it. Yeah. Like, so when, when they say they want to do these things, um, like, you know, immigration reform. There's a whole list of them, um, of things that they want to, to do. Like they mean it like they, they, so they, and that was part of this deal with removing McCarthy was that they had gotten these concessions from him and he was supposed to do certain things and he's not doing them. Yeah. Um, and this, this debt ceiling vote was, I guess, one of the big ones, mm -hmm. um, because what he did was he used Democrat votes to get the debt ceiling pushed through. Yeah, the, the funny thing about that is that um, he, like part of the reason that they wanted him removed is because he was compromising with the Democrats yeah. and working with the Democrats so much, and all of the Democrats voted to remove him. Yeah, well, that's the only way that Matt Gates could get the votes because yeah. not enough Republicans would vote with him to have him removed. So how'd and, that work out for him? Anyway? And so, yeah, which is that that's kind of the irony of this whole thing is mm -hmm. that, you know, he, he used the same type of mechanism to remove him that he was complaining about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but but your point stands, though, that that this small group of Republicans, they're serious about what they want to do mm -hmm. and how they want to change things. And I mean, I, I, a lot of their stuff I don't agree with, but I can respect that. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, leverage the power that you have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's a good example for the libertarian party. Yeah. Actually like, okay, we're a, a significant minority in any of these votes, oh, yeah. but we are, we can affect the outcome even with the being with a small art. percentage of the vote. Absolutely. And that the, this is, this shows that you can leverage that kind of minority power to, to get your way. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's a handful of Republicans that's, that's caused all of this chaos. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know the exact number or remember, but it's not, it's like less than 10 or something. Yeah. I was thinking eight was the number in my head, but that didn't sound like enough. Yeah. I, maybe that's I was, right. Six was the number in my head, Yeah, but, but it's at any rate, I'm like almost positive it's less than 10. So, mm -hmm. well, beyond that, this isn't really that interesting to me. Um, yeah, I mean that's to me that's the interesting part about it, and it's just the the world we live in is so crazy. Like yeah. this would have been like the dominating mainstream story um, years ago, but now it's like a bloop on the radar. <laughs> like I mean, it's just kind of a little something that happened. Actually, like another interesting thing to me about it is the uh, I guess the media aftermath with the Democrats. Yeah, that they're so proud of themselves for being a monolith. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they're like, oh, well, you know, these. it just shows that these Republicans, like, they don't have any loyalty. They don't, they don't stand up for each other. They're, you know, they're not all on the same page, et cetera, but we would never do that kind of thing, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't a few years ago when the opportunity arose. But yeah. I don't think that that's a positive trait. No, I don't <laughs> either. Yeah. Like, any, any... Free thinker won't think that that's a positive trait. Yeah, it's like a flock of birds. When one turns, they all turn the same direction. You know, like yeah, I don't. But that's always been a Democrat thing. Like they yeah. they always pull ranks stronger than than the Republicans. Well, do. there's more of a communal outlook on the way people should interact with each other too. Like Republicans, yeah. or I don't know about Republicans anymore. Conservatives generally are just more individualistic. Yeah. 
yeah than than liberals yeah or well what we call liberal the today. traditional yeah, yeah yeah not i guess not traditional but yeah. yeah yeah um so there's just more of a uh you know we we need to all be together kind of attitude on the left than there is on the right which is which is just generally more individualistic yeah um i and i've even heard some people say well uh, you know, this is no s- surprise because the Republicans believe in small government anyway, and I just laughed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, even so, uh, and that's something worth noting. Even the small group that m- seem to mean it, mm-hmm. I don't think they really believe in small government. No. Like, I don't, <laughs> like, I mean, I, like, you know, I, I respect the well, fact they don't that, care if the government shuts down because they don't really believe in government anyway. <laughs> like, are you kidding? Yeah, they're they're <laughs> they're not anarcho libertarians. No. Like, <laughs> they're not us. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. So. Uh, you want to get into some economic stuff? Sure. Actually, before we what, do, what do you want to um, do? I want to I want to hit just like a little foreign policy thing. Okay. Um, the U.S. has convinced the U.N. to send in a peacekeeping group to Haiti. Ooh. Remember we talked about Haiti <laughs> a year like or this. so ago? Something like that. Um, yeah. After uh, Jovenel Moise was assassinated, and this guy Henri took over and he's not very popular. Yeah. And um so now there's these these like gang factions, like warlords have taken over taking over parts of Haiti and the the government's not real strong and so the the US though supports this kind of paper leader in in Henri in Haiti. Yeah. Um and so they they've been lobbying for a while to for the UN to send a peacekeeping mission, but the U S didn't really want to be a part of it. Yeah. Because we've seen from Ukraine that like, you're just more effective executing your foreign policy with other people's troops because (laughs) then the Americans don't complain about it so much. Yeah. If the body bags aren't coming back here. Yeah. You see. So, uh, smart. Yeah. Um, so they have now convinced the, the UN to send a peacekeeping group and they have convinced Kenya to lead the group. The group. Oh wow! Yeah. So, um, and Kenya's got a bit of its own problem. One of those problems that you keep throwing your coffee all over my table. I don't know why you keep doing this. Yeah, I, I got. I brought a paper towel with me. This I don't know time. why you feel like you need to to shake it up anyway. I do it with everything. Like <laughs> yeah. the whiskey, I kind of understood. Well, not shaking it, but like swirling it around. I I get. Yeah. All right. Sorry. <laughs> um. So uh yeah they got Kenya and so one of the one of the main problems is that the Kenyans don't speak French. Oh yeah. So they they can't speak they can't to the Haitians in their own language. Yeah. And um another thing is that the the Kenyan uh police force that they're sending over there um has a history of human rights abuses and Haiti uh, has a history of being human rights abused by UN peacekeeping forces. So, so, so this so, is a match made in heaven. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> if you look into the history of UN peacekeeping in Haiti, it's not very bright. Uh, there were allegations of UN peacekeepers um, raping underage uh, girls. Um, they, uh, the UN um, peacekeeping group seems to be responsible for a cholera outbreak years ago in Haiti. Oh, I remember that. Um, yeah. the, you know, so... Is, they're they're kind of resistant to outside uh, interference anyway, yeah. and then now they're sending this Kenyan group. I, I think this is going to kind of blow up. Yeah. Um, but the important thing for us to to know as Americans, yeah, uh, besides the fact that we fully support this because we're backing this uh, unpopular leader in Haiti, um, who wasn't elected, who like took over after. Uh, a mysterious assassination that he's been implicated in. Um, (laughs) But the U S has pledged a hundred million dollars in taxpayer money to support this uh, intervention. Our our taxpayer money going to to help the world. Yep. Yep. Exactly. (laughs) So that's just, just know that that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that that was, uh, um, I haven't heard of any of this. So this is all news to me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that wasn't accepted in the budget deal that uh, we couldn't send that hundred million dollars <laughs> to bring the Kenyans over to um, rape and disease Haiti. Yeah. Wow. 
that was harsh, I guess. I, <laughs> I, there's no evidence but, that that's exactly what will happen. But yeah, but history doesn't doesn't <laughs> yeah. look kindly at this. <laughs> exactly. So um, so we'll see what happened. Uh, the the main thing is that you know once again. Um, the U.S. is funding the propping up of an unpo- unpopular leader who may have been responsible for the death of the of the person that he replaced right. um, because at least he's, like, on our side. <laughs> right. So. And we don't seem to be real concerned about human rights issues. No, no. In Haiti or anywhere else, for that anywhere matter. Anywhere for that matter, yeah. But that's a good excuse. Yeah. Um. Now we can go to economics if you want. All right. Um, You you want to start with RFKJ or you want to start with Newsom? Either one's fine with me. You got to pick. I got to pick. All right. Well, let's do RFK then. Okay. Um, So RFKJ has a new plan uh, to to create a new housing bubble. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's really the only way. I mean, that's what well, he that's what he says. So it's not, not exactly. But I don't know. Well, he okay. He doesn't use the word bubble. Okay. Well, let's play the clip and let all right the audience decide. <laughs> all right. Sounds fair. We kicked off the great prosperity in this country. That fifty years that you know economists and social scientists where we became the richest country on earth. We started it with a housing boom. And as soon as I get into office, I'm going to launch another housing boom. I'm going to issue a new class of mortgages for for 3%. I'm going to finance that by selling treasury bills at 3% that are tax-free. So the market will pay for it. All right. 3% mortgage rates. Yeah. I mean, that sounds great. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And uh, the market will absorb the cost. <laughs> Once again, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So um, just remember that treasury bonds are how the U.S. government issues debt. Yeah. Uh, so he wants to sell treasury bonds at 3% tax-free to cover the cost of these mortgages. So he wants to put the U.S. government in the U.S. government into debt to cover these mortgages. And obviously... A government-run mortgage system will work just as well as a government-run uh, student loan system. <laughs> yeah, anything. it's essentially the same thing. Yeah. Um. So just think of how well the government-run student loan program has gone, and then apply that to a mortgage. Well, and you have system. people out there openly not going to pay their student loan debts. You know, how's That's that going to work when it's a mortgage? <laughs> is the U.S. government going to? take the property back? Like, I don't know. This is an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Um, I, the, the main which, thing, of which course, by the way will happen because what's going to, it, this will end the same way the last one ended, which mm-hmm. was in out to set 2007, 2008, like right in that time. Yeah. I, I mean, that's about far enough back for people to remember. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Well, the, but don't you know that it was the free market that caused that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the pro- the little pro- pesky problem with that is, like, I remember those times. That yeah. was not the free market giving those loans. Yeah. That was the government stepping in and telling these lenders to give these loans that they knew were not going to be paid back, at least in large part. Yeah. It was the affordable housing program. They were um, uh, urging banks to issue loans to risky Mortgagees, yeah, um, and saying that they would back them, and then the the banks uh, got to a point where they were feeling like they were um, that they were holding too much risk and were bundling bad loans and selling them off to others. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it just kind of built on itself and spiraled until, from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then there was, of course, that this myth that um, housing would just always go up. Yeah. And uh, that obviously wasn't true. Yeah, I've got money put away for the next time the housing crashes. Actually, <laughs> I'm 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 waiting for it. It's going to happen soon. Oh yeah, um, I'm pretty sure. So I've got money put away to put down a, a down payment on another property. Yeah. Um, when that happens, you know, maybe pick up another uh, foreclosure like this place was. Yeah. And, um, you know, get a house for a third of its value. Yeah. Can't hurt, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and this plan that RFK is putting out, like, will will spur that. 
Like that's that's the direction you head when you artificially make these these rates low. Um, that's that's just what it is. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly one of the problems that we have in banking right now. The Fed has kept the interest rates so low for so long yeah. that there's been a bunch of malinvestment. And if you push interest rates below market value, even just in one industry like housing, yeah, you will encourage a bunch of investment in housing when that investment would be better spent somewhere else. Yeah. Just because it's cheaper to go into housing. It, it creates an artificial demand um, yeah. that, that creates a disturbance in the market, which, yeah. um, which causes more housing to be built or purchased than the market normally would. That means that those resources are going into housing when they could be going into something else that would have greater value in the long run or ha greater need at the time. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the, the Treasury bonds thing that, you know, obviously there's no way that that debt will increase inflation. <laughs> it's putting more money in the system. And, that and, always works. And debts don't matter, as we're learning. Yeah. This is all being said tongue-in-cheek, everybody. <laughs> Because yeah. um, debts do matter, yes. and inflation comes from uh, <laughs> they, they matter to the money. people. Well, the debts matter to the people who are owed the money. Yeah, like I mean, that's that's like you loaning somebody a bunch of money and being like, oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, maybe, maybe not. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, and inflation comes from uh, you know um, too much money, monetary in the expansion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and then of course uh, the bubbles are formed by artificial. Like the business cycle happens because of artificial credit expansion, yeah. which is also what this is. Yeah. So you are um, creating a bigger boom bust cycle. You are inflating a bubble and you are increasing inflation. Yeah. That's what this plan will do. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a good recipe to me. No, no. Uh, I think it's not going to be very effective. In the short term, it will probably do what he wants it to do. In the long term, it'll be damaging to our entire yeah. economy. It'll be great for his one term as president. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, on the bright side, pretty sure we're not going to see a president Kennedy. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, that right now that's the safe bet in, in 2024. Yeah. That's, that's definitely the safe bet right now, but things can change quick, man. That's true. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be counting him completely. Out. Well, and he's, did he in? I mean, there was a rumor that he was going to announce that he, he was has, running as an independent. Has he actually announced that he's running? Not as Not that independent? I'm aware of. Yeah, me. Either. Not that I've seen, and I do follow some of his pages and whatnot. But mm -hmm. but it sounds like if that that may be coming. Well, because um, he seems to be done with the Democrats. Well, he yeah. Um, I think that RFKJ running as an independent will ensure that the Democrats win the election in 2024. Oh, you think so? I think so. I think that they're... That you, you think he'll split more of the Republicans than the Democrats? I do. Well, I mean, you, there's yeah. an argument to be made. Now, if he's pitching these type of plans, I don't know that that's the case. Um, yeah, where, especially where he if pulls, it's a Biden-Trump uh, matchup. Yeah. Um, in a Biden-Trump matchup, I think with RFKJ running as, a, as an independent, yeah. I think that he takes more Trump votes than he does Biden votes. Yeah. Um, because well, he's, it, he's an outsider candidate, but he's not as offensive as Trump is. That's and so true. there's a bunch of people that would have voted for Trump because they, they like some of the things that he is doing, or they see him as an outsider that they would rather have than a, than a old time politician. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but they can't stand Trump. And if it's just Trump Biden, they're going to vote for Trump anyway, just because, like yeah. you know, an independent because he's the guy, or yeah. he's the most outsider, yeah. right? Um, that he's the most likely to to result in some kind of real change. Yeah. But with RFKJ in the race, then those more left leaning or the Republicans that really don't like Donald Trump um, gives them somewhere to this go. This is a cleaner candidate. He's uh, you know much more establishment friendly, yeah. even though he's not establishment. Yeah. Um, he, he looks the part better. He acts the part better. Yeah. Um, I think that he still, that he takes more Trump votes than he does Biden votes. And, and part of that also is back to that, just, uh, that, um, group think Democrat, yeah. you know, mentality that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. 
No. Vote blue, vote blue no matter who. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Um, now, there's plenty of, of people on the right that feel that way, too. Um, oh, trust me. I live down here. I know. Yeah, but um, but there is more of an individualistic tre- streak on the right than there is on the left. And yeah. especially when you're talking about independence, um, they may be drawn to uh, an outsider candidate, um, but they would prefer the... Uh, one with decorum than the brash Donald Trump, I think. There's enough yeah. of them that yeah. that would have voted for Trump that would rather vote for RFKJ. And I don't think that he, I just don't think that he peels that many votes away from Biden when it comes down to it. Yeah. I mean, you're probably right. Like I said. So um, I think the result of RFKJ entering the race as an independent is the assurance that the Democrats win, yeah. which makes you kind of wonder. He's got to take that into account himself you well would think. I, won't, I i don't know that he thinks of it that way and i don't know that the democrats think of it that way like yeah yeah well there's they're definitely scared of him running as an independent yeah like that's that's been made clear but i don't think they should be yeah i, I think that the best thing they could do is force him to run as an independent <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> so um but well, I, I could be completely wrong yeah yeah, I mean, these, I mean I well, know. there's no way to know in, in these type of things. Yeah, you know. Um, but I, I feel confident. Yeah, yeah. I always feel confident. <laughs> right. Um, so. Okay. Uh, so the other, I guess, on to Newsom. Yeah, let's do it. Um, we may have a short episode. That would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I've been sitting here a long time. <laughs> well, you have, but we hadn't been recording that long. Yeah. We're, we're only like forty minutes in here. Yeah. Um. Oh, but we got the one. Yeah, you know, we got the one other thing. No, we're we're gonna end up running just fine. Yeah. Um. So uh, Newsom has a new plan. Uh, well, I guess it's not really his plan, but there's a new there's a bill that was just signed in California, yeah. and we'll just let him explain. That well, good. we'll let the news explain and then him comment. All right. Okay. California is raising the minimum wage for fast food workers. They'll soon be paid $20 an hour, the highest minimum wage in the country. The governor says the increase acknowledges that many fast food workers are their family's primary breadwinners. There's a lot of mythology about fast food. You know, Johnny used to learn the value of hard work. You know, he'd work a few hours in his first job. That's not the case, folks. That's a romanticized version of a world that doesn't exist. We have the opportunity to reward that contribution, reward that sacrifice, and stabilize an industry. About half a million workers will be affected by the increase. Critics say the wage hike will place a bigger burden on both businesses and consumers. I think the critics are right. Yeah, 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 I think. <laughs> I think the critics are right. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I guess all we could really need to do is just talk about minimum wage. What, is, what yeah. does minimum wage do? Yeah, it prices people out of the market. It it just it amazes me that out of the job market. Out of the job market. Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't know, there's just so <clears throat> many things in that clip. Like he talks about like the sacrifice and everything that the fast food workers make and whatnot. And I you know, I I haven't personally worked in that industry, but I know plenty of people that still do and have. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying they don't make a sacrifice, but all I'm saying is it it's not it's it's a job. Like it's a job like any other job. Like I just I don't understand the it just it blows my mind. Well, um I actually heard another clip on No Agenda. I didn't pull it because I, I originally I didn't think that we would take it this way, but he actually talks about it in terms of um and I guess this clip they pulled from France twenty four. Yeah. Um he talks of it in, in terms of uh, reparations. Yeah. That so much of the industry is uh, non-white. Yeah. And so that the, they were looking at it as a way of compensating non-whites. Um, <laughs> That's an interesting take. I hadn't yeah. heard that. But um, but it, I, I think uh, this is what I, I find it interesting that he says you know, stabilize the industry. Yeah. Um, an industry that, by the way, is, is just flat on its face struggling. Like yeah. since COVID, the fast food industry has taken a hit. And because ha- everybody delivers now and everybody has pickup? Yes. Yeah. Um, so you can get food from anywhere. It doesn't yeah. have to be fast you food. You can get good food and good pick food. it up. <laughs> well, and that's kind of what, what I was going to get at a yeah. minute ago is like that the quality in your 
average fast food place is just atrocious. Like it's, you know, it, it's just the reality of the situation. Like that's not to say every fast food place is that way, but like generally speaking, it's just not high quality. Yeah. Well, I, I remember when I was younger, um, if I had time to sit, yeah, I would go to Waffle House. Yeah. I mean, because you get your food almost as quickly. Oh, yeah. yeah. At, at a Waffle House. Yeah. But you can watch them make it, and it's just better. It is. Yeah. And it's just, it, often it's cheaper. <laughs> that, that's that's some southern hibachi right there. <laughs> yeah. Often it's cheaper, too. Yeah. I, I remember I was talking, um, so my mom and I went to, I hadn't been to Waffle House in a while, actually. Yeah. But my mom and I went to Waffle House for like a kind of a brunch um, the other day because we had a meeting with her contractor in the morning. Yeah. And, um, and it was like kind of between, it was too late for breakfast, too early for lunch. We went to Waffle House. Yeah. Also, she's out in the middle of nowhere right now. So there's not a lot <laughs> but, around. But there is a Waffle House. There is right? a Waffle House. <laughs> I knew there would be. So, uh, and I enjoyed it. It was good. And, but it was, um, it, it was surprisingly expensive to me. Yeah. And it still wasn't expensive. Yeah. I, it was like less than 10 bucks a person. Yeah, you're gonna you pay know. that at a fast food place now. Oh yeah, easy. Exactly. Easy. But I was telling her, I said, I remember when, um, when I was younger, and I used to stop at Waffle House like on my way home from work sometimes, and and get dinner. Yeah. And things like that, and you know, I'd have a full meal, or certainly enough for me for a full meal. Yeah. Um, and my bill would be like a dollar eighty. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, two bucks. Yeah. Um, something like that. And I would leave a five because <laughs> yeah. like that's still way cheaper than I would have spent on a meal anywhere. And, you know, yeah. here, let the waitress have uh, have a really nice tip. And yeah. like, hell, I still got a meal for five bucks and a good meal for five bucks. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Them days long over. Yeah, but, that's too but bad. But that is another reason why, like I say... It, it was I, cash only in those days, too. It was, yeah. I remember that. Um, but it it's... That industry is already in trouble, mm -hmm. um, and this isn't going to help with that at all as far as the imposed minimum wage. Yeah, if he thinks he's helping poor people, then he's way off. Oh, I actually just recently heard... I think I, think I heard Dave Smith talking about it. Um, about Walter Block's explanation of minimum wage. Yeah. Um, he said, you know, all, all these, per this is kind of Walter Block speaking through yeah. a third party. So, <laughs> kind of a couple of go-betweens on I this one. I have one of Walter Block's books. I don't remember him talking about minimum wage though. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so um, Walter Block was saying, you know, these, these uh, progressives, they think that minimum wage is a floor. Um, that, okay, well now people in this, in this industry won't make any less than this. Yeah. He said, but it's not a floor. It's a hurdle. Yep. And you just keep raising the hurdle. Like you just set a, a level where they have to be this good to even make it over. Yeah. Um, so you haven't set a floor, you've set a hurdle. And so what's going to happen now with a $20 minimum wage in for fast food workers in California is that all of those fast food workers are going to be replaced with kiosks and apps. Well, I was fixing to say they're fixing to start being eliminated. There's going to be less of them. Yeah, um, because you can a kiosk or an app costs you way less than twenty dollars an hour in the long run. Exactly, and it's it just becomes the investment. If how much does the company want to invest in its future? Mm -hmm. Because it can spend a little extra money now and put the kiosks in and get rid of the um, labor overhead. Yeah. And it just, it makes, all of a sudden, it makes a lot more sense to put that kiosk in and not pay the person. Yeah. Like, it's it's just the price of entry, you know. Can you imagine making $40,000 a year to sit behind a cash register at McDonald's? That's wild. <laughs> well, well, and the thing he says about the um, romanticized idea of the first job and stuff, mm. like, that is... The case for a lot, I mean, that's where you normally get your first job yeah. is in fast food. And that's not to say that everybody in the establishment I went to is, a grocery store. Me too, actually. I've yeah. never worked in fast food. So. Me neither. <laughs> um, but I've worked in retail a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, it's usually, it was well, either retail or fast food, though, is your first job. And that's not yeah. to say everybody that works in a fast food place 
that's what they are. Uh, because this is the whole idea behind the minimum wage is you can take that entry level position and turn it into a career. Yeah. And plenty of people do that mm-hmm. and make a good me- living working in fast food. Mm-hmm. I know plenty of these people. Um, like I say, it's so it's out there. Yeah. But when you when you create a minimum wage, especially one that's like twenty dollars an hour, you now that person doesn't have can't get that entry level position, and it, it closes doors for people who would have otherwise had one. Well, think of there's some other interesting bits about this too. Talking about distorting a market, distorting yeah. a labor market. So he's only raising minimum wage for fast food industry. Yeah, which is strange to me anyway. So the rest of the industries in California still have whatever the minimum wage was before. Yeah. And we'll grant to them that it's like $12 an hour because I bet it's higher than the national minimum wage. But I, I, I guarantee you it is. But. Yeah. So we'll say 12 Yeah. Um, well, now people working those jobs are going to leave those jobs to go work at fast food places. Yeah. So. What you've also done is you've created a uh, a greater supply of fast food workers than there are fast food jobs to fill. Yeah. And at the same time, you've probably reduced the number of fast food jobs by making them so expensive. Exactly. Uh, and even if you haven't, you've raised the price of all the fast food product, yep. which also will have the impact of lowering the demand for that product. Yeah. Which is why I think that fast food is on its way out. Like I, within 10 years, I'm not saying fast food will completely be gone, but there will be far less options. And in the next few years, I think you're going to see some of the big guys fold. And Taco Bell will be the only one that's left. <laughs> it's possible. I, somehow I doubt it, but <laughs> I think it's going to be pizza. Well, that's what happened in Demolition Man. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny is that – was it you that was telling me that the um, that the UK version had uh, pizza, Hut. pizza Hut as yeah. the, the winner of the franchise wars? Yeah. All right. Those two – Two restaurants are owned by the same company. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. They are, yeah. KFC's part of them too. Yep. All three of those. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it used to be Tricon. I don't know what it's called now. Yeah, that is funny. Yeah. Uh, so well, they, they had skin in the game somewhere in producing that movie. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, the Brits, they just, they don't really like Taco Bell, so <laughs> they eat pizza. Use yeah. Pizza Hut instead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Funny. I, I would love to hear the discussion that went yeah, how that played out behind mm-hmm. the scenes. Um, so. so yeah, it's a huge distortion in the in the labor market in California, um, and nobody's going to win. Yeah, like you're definitely not helping poor people. You're just putting well, them out of work. And you're going to see. I think you'll see more of these fast food companies just leave California. Yeah. Uh, and that's already a trend, not in California, but in some of these big cities. I know Target was one of them I heard just this week or last yeah. week. Well, that- Target kept getting raided in um, poor communities. Yeah. And they said, you know, to hell with it. We're just going to take our business somewhere Which, else. Which, like I say, I, I hate it for those communities, for the people that weren't involved in the raiding of it, yeah. you know, but because it does suck for them, mm-hmm. but it's the right business move. Yeah. Like if you can't make money in an area, you pull out of it. Yeah. Um, you would have a better idea what the numbers might be like. Like, what do you imagine the shrink percentage was in those kind of stores? Oh, I can only imagine. I mean, um, I mean, like here locally, stores that I'm a part of and seen numbers for mm-hmm. are running anywhere between three and six percent. Like do you think that it would be pushing like 20 so percent in those kind of places? It's got to be 20%. Yeah. It wow. has to be. Can you um, imagine if like, a fifth just, of your product just, just walked out the door. I mean, we, <laughs> yeah. we freak out about like a, like if a store has a 6% inventory, um, like that's a flip out. Like that's a complete like yeah. overhaul of what, of what's going on in that building, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I can only imagine, but the deal is in those areas, there's the, it, they There's, decriminalize theft. Well, they that's did. The well, that's thing. that's the problem. But the way the company looks at it generally, because we, the company I work for, has stores in bad areas and Mobile and stuff, mm-hmm. and I've been a part of a lot of the discussions and how we handle that. And it's just a really basic, you know, the good stores are going to pay for the bad stores, and so that's the way. I'm sure that's the way they were looking at it 
with Target is like, at least up until now, they're like, well, you know, the, the good ones are, are compensating for the bad ones. Yeah. And you know, that we want to be part of this community, you know, we want to help and blah, blah, blah. But at some point you have to cut your losses. Yeah. Like you can't, because on top of you, something you've got to remember, at least with the company that I deal with. So we have these stores in these bad communities and mm-hmm. they're like hemorrhaging product and not making a lot of money. But on top of making a lot of money, we're paying for extra security in those stores. We've got extra cameras in those stores. Mm-hmm. Loss prevention is spending extra time in those stores. Like mm-hmm. there, it's more than just the loss of the product that you're looking at. Yeah. It's, there's so much more to it. Um, and at some point you do have to kind of look at it and be like, dude, we can't continue to make money this way. Yeah. So hmm. it's, it's interesting. All right. Well, um, anything more on minimum wage or the impact of this, uh, other this than plan? it sucks. Well, <laughs> it's stupid. It, yeah. It's just, it doesn't. And I know I've had discussions with plenty of people, you know, for, but that were for the minimum wage and mm-hmm. like, it's, it is a funny thing. Like, because on its face, it's like, oh, well, you're helping people who need it. Like, yeah, you know, everybody's working hard. Like, there should be a minimal amount of money. But then when you start digging into it kind of like what we just did and start peeling back the layers, you start realizing real quick that it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, I, this is one of those things. I have plenty of criticisms of Gary Johnson as the Libertarian Party candidate, but this was one of the things that he always nailed. Yeah. Um, that he was really good at explaining to people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember an interview, I think this was 2016. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was 2016. Anyway, I don't remember now. Yeah. Um, but uh, it could have been 2012. But yeah. um, I, anyway, he, he was in an interview, and they were, uh, they were giving him a hard time about not wanting to abolish minimum wage. Yeah. And he said... Well, what do you think is the right level? And they were like, uh, well, you know, $15 an hour or whatever they were saying. Because at that time it was yeah. the fight for 15 like, Yeah. yeah. Um, and he was like, well, uh, you know, so if minimum wage, uh, if raising the minimum wage helps people, why don't we just raise it to $75 an hour? Yeah. Or $100. Mm-hmm. $1,000 an and, hour. And, and yeah. And that's kind of the, like the argument that, that's easy to make to people that, all right, like, look start thinking about this in in the right terms if raising minimum wage is good yeah. then the higher you can raise it the better it is right yeah. like that's what follows yeah. so if raise minimum wage to $1000 an hour what do you think happens yeah. well what happens is you put everybody that's not worth $1000 an hour out of work if yeah. you can't produce $1000 uh, an hour of of production uh, production yeah yeah then you don't have a job anymore. Now yeah. go the other way with it. Reduce minimum wage down to zero. Yeah. Well, now I then, hire as many people as I want. Yeah. Now everybody can get a job yeah. because everybody who wants a job can get a job because you can find something that somebody will pay you some level the, to to do. Yeah. Like you're always worth more than zero. Yeah, exactly. And so even if that number, and, and the point I always like to make is even if that number is really low, something mm-hmm. like, which by the way, this was my first job was $5 an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if you're making just $5 an hour, it's a door. Yeah. It's an entry level thing. And you can turn that into anything that you can turn it into. Mm -hmm. And there's, well, some companies are better than others. Like, you know, some companies you get that entry level job and you're just never going to get past that point. But there's plenty of companies that if you do the right things and work hard, you can Mm -hmm. turn that entry level job into a career. Yeah. And remember in our supply demand charts, we know that if you lower the price of something that you increase the demand. Yeah. All right. So if you lower the price of labor to zero or near zero, yeah. you increase the demand almost infinitely Yeah. for labor. So what does that do? What that does is that you now have employers competing for employees yeah. instead of employees competing for jobs. Exactly. Which drives the price for employees for labor up. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, labor costs can be really low if you've got more workers than you have jobs. Yeah. But if you have more jobs than you have workers, then that starts pushing wages up, up, yeah, absolutely. up. Because well, then all these employers are competing to try and fill their positions. And the truth is that's where we're at now. So the Well, yeah, but again, it's artificially. 
Well, I, I don't know that that's even well, where we're at currently in the state of Alabama. Mm-hmm. I don't think that that's true because no. um, so the we have what the federal minimum wage is, mm-hmm. and it's like either seven twenty five or eight twenty five, uh, and I don't even know what it is because mm-hmm. I, I I don't hire people at that. Like I couldn't. Like yeah. it's it's you couldn't find a job making minimum wage right now if you tried. Mm. They're not out there. Jobs are not paying the minimum wage because there's such a we, there's just not enough workers right now to do the jobs. Yeah. So, I mean, you look around and you drive around. Everywhere mm-hmm. is hiring. There's yeah. signs up everywhere. Well, and those yeah. jobs ain't paying five, seven twenty five or eight twenty five. Yeah. They're paying ten dollars at a minimum. Yeah. Mostly like twelve plus. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's true. But what I meant by um, it's artificial is that the shortage is artificial. Okay. Um, the shortage is artificial because people got paid so much to do nothing. Oh well, that's, uh, during there's, the pandemic, yeah, there's and that, um, yeah. the the benefits are so high. Like a, as you raise unemployment benefits, the bar that has to be reached for people to take a job to go into is, a job is much is, higher. Yeah. And and to give an example, like if unemployment is paying you three hundred dollars a week, yeah. and you're offered a, a ten dollar an hour job, yeah. forty hours a week, that's four hundred dollars a week. You make more money. Yeah. But you're only making a hundred more than you would do in nothing. So are you yeah. gonna take a job? Are you gonna work forty hours for an extra hundred bucks? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so every time you raise the benefits, actually you raise the bar before people will take before they'll be productive instead of not being productive. Oh yeah. And I've I've seen that play out in real life. Like mm-hmm. I've I've made plenty of job offers to people that are like, yeah, I am better off doing what I'm doing now, which is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so unemployment I mean, pays me almost as much. I just sit home and yeah, I don't have to do anything exactly. for that. And, and play computer well, games all no, day long. They they have to do something for that. They have to come to me for the interview. Oh right. Well yeah, I remember doing that when I was in Georgia. You know what they required yeah. um for uh, unemployment benefits in Georgia? Was that? three contacts a week. Yeah. That's like Fill out three um, applications. applications or yep. make three phone calls. Yeah. You didn't have to pursue it any farther. Yeah. If you got a call back, you didn't have to respond. Yep, like, exactly. Nothing. Well, it's it's the same same way here. And what's really funny is, is, and I've been known to do this, just go through our little system and just hire everybody that's in there. Like, just you don't yeah. even have to contact them. It yeah. just it'll automatically send them an email that they're hired. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. man. Talk about getting some ugly phone calls there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want this job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, do, do we want to do this theater of the absurd story? We're, it's up to you. I mean, no, it's up to you. I'm, I'm, it's you're, always you get up, to make, it's, it's not up to always me. up to you. What <laughs> it's are you always talking about? Been up to I me never tonight. force you to make decisions. <laughs> Except tonight. Yes. Well, let's do it then. If All you're right. asking me, then we're doing it. Okay. I'm sorry, everybody. That it's a little long. Yeah, we got say. long clip inbound. Yeah, but here it is. <laughs> yeah. Fox 13's mind spoke with the woman and her wife and Allie. Their attackers are already out of jail, so I imagine that leaves them feeling extra unsafe tonight. Shiloh Thorpe was non-binary for a couple of years, but a voice inside her sure. was telling her there was something more. Tried out, you know, saying I'm a woman and I'd like to live my life as a woman in my head, saying that and seeing how that felt, felt pretty good. The 27-year-old started embracing who she really is. With the support of her wife, Scarlett, she started her transition a year ago. I knew there was going to be issues, um, but I thought it would be the issues we faced. And so far, that's just been yelling from cars. Uh, someone stole a flag. The situation escalated, she says, about a month ago. A man in his 20s was standing inside her home. Because our toddler has tantrums because she's a toddler. Tuesday, their worst fears became a reality. I start hearing, like, really loud crashing noises. Like things falling and breaking and all this stuff. Shiloh says she believes her neighbors threw her stroller, car seat, shoes, and two-year-old's daughter's toys over the balcony. In her search for their belongings, she says she questioned her neighbors who were outside and says one of them became confrontational. Yeah, so at one point, uh, the, the blonde guy, you know, smacks my face and is still like, yeah, come on, let's do something. There. Shiloh says she slapped him and her neighbor unleashed on her. Um, the blonde guy picked me up and slammed me to the ground. I didn't see exactly what was happening, but apparently they were kicking. And 
it was just over and over and over and over, and they were calling me the F story. Scarlett witnessing the assault from their third story window, their daughter in her arms. She called 911. She says immediately the two jumped in their car and spun off, leaving Shiloh outside their apartment complex beaten. I wasn't even like remotely scared of men before, and I am now. Like, and just I randoms. I, I can't, I don't trust anybody. And I hate that she has to learn that part of being a woman, because we all know it. We all know what it's like to be afraid of men. Seattle police confirming the case to Fox 13, saying two men were arrested. Those charging documents are still pending, but according to the mothers, the men were released. The judge released them. He's not calling it a hate crime because they had broken into my house and that wasn't um, motivated by hate. They're saying because there was history, they can't call this a hate crime. All right. Um, I will admit that when I first heard this, yeah, uh, I thought that he she said that he struck she struck the first blow. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, the next time I listen, at, when I cut the clip, actually, then I I heard him, her, whatever, <laughs> say he she is fine. That's a perfectly acceptable. Okay. So you know which one I'm talking about exactly. Um. That the the blonde dude, the big blonde guy, smacked him in the face and said, "What are you going to do?" or whatever. All right, yeah. so that that actually like changes things a little bit. Oh yeah. Uh, but you know the the thing that's probably to stand out is like right at the end when they say um, that they had released them, uh, that they hadn't brought charges yet, et cetera, because yeah. there was a history. Yeah. And they don't explain what that history is. Yeah. I can give you some thoughts on what I think it is. Well, I mean, there's other information if you read and so forth, too. Like, it seems that these tenants are a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so for the people listening at home, you don't get to actually see these people. <laughs> but I can tell you this by looking at them. I bet they're a pain in the ass. They look like a pain in the ass. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. I When I was, when I was a teenager and in my 20s, um, you couldn't having blue hair didn't assign you to a particular political group. It does now. It does, and it frustrates me. And I don't even know necessarily how true it is because I see people with this hair all the time. And I always, I'll like uh, to the point I want to like start taking a poll and asking them how they voted in the last election. Yeah, because I am like generally curious if the hair color is actually an indicator or not. Uh-huh. Um, because I don't know that it necessarily is. But it, I mean, it seems to be that way in media. Like so, so like in this scenario, you mm. know which way them two voted in Both the last Both the husband, election. wife, and the wife, wife, yeah, um, have blue hair. Yeah, and like an enormous amount of piercings. And then, well, okay, so yeah, let me explain that too. <laughs> if you can't understand him, her, yeah. it's because he has so much metal in his mouth that it's just probably difficult to Clanking speak. around. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I don't find that attractive personally. Uh, it doesn't bother me, but he is, he, she is wearing a skirt. Yeah. And sort of has boobs maybe. Yeah. I couldn't really figure out what was going on there. And I wasn't really trying to, by the way. No, it's the whole thing was hard to understand. Like the, the, the timeline of this is very confusing to me. Um, so apparently there have been like noise complaints and, and disruption complaints and so forth from the neighbors about this couple. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole thing about, I, I heard somebody throwing stuff off my balcony. So I went outside and confronted my neighbors who were on the ground. That part doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I could be misunderstanding, but I got the impression from balcony that it wasn't a first floor apartment. Yeah. And so if somebody's throwing stuff off of your balcony, it seems like you would go to your balcony. Yeah. Not the ground. (laughs) <laughs> not outside. Yeah. Um, and that anybody that was on the ground outside was probably not responsible well, for what was going on in the balcony. And his, in his, his, her defense, uh-huh. um, he did say that he was going to retrieve the things. That's um, true. That's so, true. But then he confronts these people out in the yard. Like they did it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's a hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then, okay. So I would, if somebody came out to me, and just started accusing me of stuff. Yeah. That would set me off a little too. Yeah. 
I mean, it would me. Like, I can tell you that. Like, um, so, but here's the thing that I, I find f- funniest. Yeah. I, and I probably shouldn't find this funny because, you know, yeah. we're opposed to violence. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. Um, bringing violence against peaceful people. Agreed. And I, I don't think that this was a peaceful person anymore. I originally did. Yeah. Um, that they were talking trash, but not yeah. physically violent. But it sounds like, I mean, if we're to trust this p- person. The source, yeah. Yeah. Um, then the then the big blonde dude hit him first. Yeah. But he slaps, he, she slaps the guy and then proceeds to get the stuff kicked out of him. Yeah. Now, this is what I find kind of funny about this is that like he may be he she may be wearing a skirt and call him him herself a girl. Yeah. But you can't every expect everybody else to see it that way. Now, yeah. The truth is that like he she can do with whatever he she wants with his life, her yeah. life. God, this is really this is difficult. Calm. Yeah. I know this is hard discussion to have. Um I don't have a problem with this. I don't have a problem with, with transness or whatever. If that's how you want to live your life, go ahead. Yeah. I, the reasoning is a little weird. It felt good when I called myself a girl, so I decided that this is my lifestyle now. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know that the one actually follows the other. No. But granting that, this person can live however they want. Oh, yeah. Free I don't care. Yeah. Uh, but you can't expect everybody else to buy into your delusion. Yeah. <laughs> and um and actually forcing this delusion on them I think is is a kind of coercion or violence in a in a sense. I agree. But here's the thing that I think is funny about it is that um this person expected to receive the same kind of restraint and deference yeah that an actual woman gets when she slaps a guy. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and it didn't work out. No, <laughs> because those other people probably knew him as a guy before, oh, without question, and probably still think of him, her, as a guy. Yeah. And when <laughs> he she hit one of them, yeah, they reacted like they would if a guy had. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I guess the lesson there is if you're a trans person, don't slap. At least close your fist. Yeah, like, right. You better make it worth it. If <laughs> at you're least make hit. it worth your time, <laughs> yeah. right? Better make it worth it if you're going to hit somebody. But that that's the thing that I think is funniest about this. And I, I, I probably shouldn't think... I almost kind of feel bad about thinking it's funny. But I do think it's funny yeah. that, um, that this person expected to receive the same kind of restraint and deference from these guys as they would probably give to a woman that hit them. Yeah. Um, but he, she's not really a woman. Nope, that's not what's going on here. And didn't receive that same kind of restraint and deference. Yeah. So. And I, I do laugh a little at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell you, man. It's a uh, strange, strange world we live in. Yeah, it really is. Like, just listening to that clip, I was just like, man, like, what planet are we living on? Well, I this is Seattle. It's a it's a different world. Yeah, clearly, uh, <laughs> I um far away from South Alabama. <laughs> yeah, I would like to know what the history was. Yeah, well, I mean, I could, beyond just the things that I, that I was able to suss out, like that that yeah. there had been complaints from the neighbors about these people before. Well, I can tell you just from the little bit I saw in the clip, this couple is annoying as crap. And the I, my belief is is even they they've pissed off everybody in that little community they live in mm-hmm. um, through one way or another, and the people that live there are tired of them. Yeah. Well, okay. So one other thing, and this is something that I would kind of like some audience interaction on because because I'm a guy, and I yeah. just I guess I don't understand this, but I found the whole um, I hate that he had to learn. Fear of men like all of us women feel. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and so I'm just curious. Yeah. Do all women just fear feel men? a fear of men? I'd, I'd be curious to know myself. I, I Like I said, I don't know. I would I mean, have to do, say it do depends you on the woman. you all walk around a fear of men around you all the time? I mean, it might be. I don't know. I mean, I, me just guessing... 
would say that there's probably a percentage of women who do feel that way. Mm -hmm. Like that wouldn't surprise me, yeah. but I don't think it's a majority. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't see how, I mean, just I've interacted with enough women in my life to know that, you know, they're, or maybe they're just not afraid of me. I don't know. Maybe that's what it yeah. is. <laughs> I don't maybe, strike fear maybe, in the I'm hearts not, of women around me. I, I, maybe not. Maybe, yeah, now that I'm thinking about maybe it. I maybe I should do things differently. <laughs> yeah, I've got to question my whole life outlook. <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't know. I, I find it hard to believe that a majority, because there's, like, I can see the less, um, uh, what's the word? What, I'm confident, looking? maybe? Confident women feeling that way. But I've, I've, I feel like most, not most, a majority of women are pretty confident. And just wouldn't have that fear just because mm -hmm. it's a man. Like, I just don't, I don't see it. Yeah. I mean, is it, yeah. It seems like you would have had to have had a number of bad interactions in your life to just like feel that as a general thing. To get you there. Yeah. Thing. And I doubt that most people have had that kind of number of bad interactions. Yeah. Especially that they could attribute specifically to gender difference. Yeah. Yeah. That well because he is a man and I'm a woman. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious. So Michael at the Liberty Mike, like I I am I'm genuinely cur curious about this. Yeah. Uh because I haven't had this experience obviously. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't lived as a woman yet. I haven't lived as a woman. Maybe I would like it and <laughs> apparently it feels I good. Just, yeah. Maybe it would feel good and I would just need to change my lifestyle entirely. <laughs> if it feels good, you have to do it. That's the rule. Right. <laughs> that's the that, world we live in. That's that's why I drink. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> and we've came full circle. <laughs> yep. All right. So we may as well close there, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, Libertarian Party, Bowen County Hope to see Convention some people this tomorrow. weekend. Yeah. Saturday, the 7th. Tomorrow. Noon. Yeah, well, but I don't <laughs> know when for, people listen to this, so yeah, well, I don't want to say yeah. tomorrow when somebody listens to it on Tuesday and shows <laughs> yeah. up. We won't you know, be there. We won't, yeah. So Saturday the 7th, noon, yeah. at the Beef Up Brady's in Spanish Fort, Alabama. And if you get there in time, you'll get to hear me ramble for, <laughs> I don't know, some period of time. Yeah. Which you clearly enjoy because you've stayed all night tonight on the podcast. Yeah. I, I have been rambling for an hour, so hopefully I can fill the time that they <laughs> have they a lot of to you. fill. Yep. I, like if I run out of the things that I had planned to talk about, I'll just talk about something else. It won't matter. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. Always come up with something. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe I'll tell them about trans people thinking that they can slap somebody without getting hit back. Uh, yeah. uh, all right. So, yeah. Um, if you can come to that thing tomorrow, great. We'd love to see you. And uh, if not, you know, there's other things you can do. Like follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Um, like and share, comment, subscribe, uh, leave a review. Email me at michael at the liberty mike.com. Um, tell your friends, etc., etc., etc. All of these things help us a lot, and we really appreciate it. And uh, we plan to be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Thank you.